Now, what I want to first ask is, what is the significance to the fact that Dope Inc. is being published now? Well, there's a certain really delicious irony to the timing of the publication, kind of underscores that in many respects, this is the best of all possible worlds. Uh, we worked out a uh, publishing agreement with a West Coast publishing house, and uh, the book has been in the works for the better part of a year. But uh, in particular, the fact that it has been released for publication in the last several months uh, is of great significance because right now we are witnessing the final disintegration of precisely the British international monetary system that has been integral to Dope Inc. going back centuries. But in particular, what we're witnessing now and it may very well happen uh, over the course of the next several days, is the collapse of the inter-alpha banking system. This is the uh, City of London-centered financial cartel that was established in 1971 at exactly the moment that the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates and regulated banking uh, that had been established by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1944 was eliminated altogether. It occurred with great involvement of the uh, Harold Wilson government in Great Britain. It was nominally done by Richard Nixon and some British agents, including both George Shultz and Henry Kissinger, were instrumental in convincing Nixon to wipe out the Bretton Woods system. One of the consequences of the elimination of that regulated fixed exchange rate international banking system is that it opened the opportunity for speculators and criminals to have total access to the international financial system. It used to be that American banks were highly regulated and that American banks did not have corresponding relationships with banks in places like the Cayman Islands or the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, areas that are at the center of the criminalization of international finance. You're saying that what the Nixon administration did in 1971 to float the dollar and eliminate the fixed exchange rate internationally set the basis for what we're seeing today with the collapse of the financial system? Absolutely. What, what we did is we shifted over from sovereign currencies, from regulated banking, and got more and more into a system of anything goes, uh, international finance, money laundering, highly leveraged, unregulated speculation, all of the things that reached a break point in the year 2007 when the U.S. real estate bubble blew out and that set off a chain reaction that we're seeing playing out literally this week where the Irish government is being pressured under the terms of the Maastricht and Lisbon treaties to use taxpayers money and to impose murderous austerity on the Irish people to bail out several of the major inter-alpha banks, including Allied Irish Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, a number of others. So it's the Jacob Rothschild banking cartel that was set up at exactly the moment that the Bretton Woods system was eliminated that is now going down the tubes. And those are the banks through which trillions of dollars a year in uh, the proceeds from illegal drug trafficking are laundered. They're the main access point into the central bloodstream of the global financial system for criminal money. In fact, back in February of 2009, uh, months after we had the next big ratchet collapse of the U.S. banking system with the blowout of Lehman Brothers, uh, the blowout of AIG Insurance, and then another gigantic bailout. At that point, the head of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, Mr. Costa, gave an interview in which he said that because panic in the banking system has completely dried up credit, 
the only money available for any kind of purchases of real estate and things like that is drug money and other criminal proceeds. So what he was really saying is that you have a total integration of the so-called legitimate international financial system with the elements of what we at EIR called way back in 1979, Dope Inc., to make the point that this is an international financial and industrial cartel that operates like an international cartel and runs a global drug trade ultimately on behalf of the British monarchy. So what has changed then, uh, since then, when Costa made that remark and now? Well, it's gotten a lot worse for the Inter Alpha Group and for the entire British offshore financial structures um, because nothing was done to solve the underlying problem. And the problem is that the entire British-centered global financial system is totally and irreparably bankrupt. There is no way that you can put it back together again. There's not enough murderous austerity that can be imposed on the populations of Europe and the Americas and other parts of the world to come up with enough money to bail out this bubble. It's doomed. And so right now, we have the happy specter of the disintegration of the British system. And we have a moment of opportunity here. We could go back to a system of regulated banking. Lyndon LaRouche has been demanding this for years, that here in the United States, we go back to a Glass-Steagall standard in which commercial banks are completely separated from brokerage houses, hedge funds, insurance companies, and that uh, the speculative debt is simply written off. If you go to a gambling casino and lose all of your money, uh, you should not have the right to turn to taxpayers and expect them to bail out your gambling debts. Well, guess what? That's what we've been doing consistently since the blowout of 2007. And now, in Ireland, the Irish government is coming under massive pressure from London, from the European Central Bank, from the International Monetary Fund to force the Irish people to swallow a bailout of the inter-alpha banks. And it looks right now, particularly after a big electoral defeat for the Irish government yesterday, that that government is going to fall and that an opposition is going to come in that's going to simply say, no, we're not going to bail this bubble out. And if that happens, then the whole inter-alpha City of London financial system is finished. And the question then becomes, what is done to, re to fill that vacuum? Do we go back to an American system, Hamiltonian approach, in which case we would have Glass-Steagall in the United States, similar re-regulation in other parts of the world, and probably very rapidly, a treaty to both establish once again, a fixed exchange rate and laws that would regulate banking to shut the door on criminal access to the banking system. That's been the hallmark of the British doping policy going back hundreds of years to have British banks that are at the disposal, top down, of the international criminal enterprise of doping global trade in opium, in heroin, in cocaine, in marijuana, and all of these illegal drugs. But right now, that amounts to at least a trillion dollars a year in revenue generated by illegal drug sales. It destroys the minds of countless millions of people around the world. And it's both a mechanism for maintaining the financial controls of the British Empire and it's a way of destroying the minds of whole populations. So people are willing to be submissive to this kind of control. What has been the impact of exposing this apparatus since you first exposed it in 1979? What has been the impact of the book and of the, the organizing internationally? Well, look, for starters, back in 1979, uh, the international drug trade was at a real takeoff point. Uh, and uh, you had massive increases in production 
of illegal drugs. You had been through the 68er period a decade earlier where you suddenly had a very large and very vulnerable population of baby boomers in their 20s and 30s who were basically into illegal drugs. It was a dominant factor in what used to be called the drug rock sex counterculture. So uh, drug trafficking, drug addiction, and the mental deterioration that went along with that was skyrocketing. But law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies all around the world tended to see this drug problem from the bottom up. They tended to think about criminal gangs that are part of an underground and underworld, even the language that's used, implies that it's some kind of low-life operation running up from the sewers. And what we demonstrated, really proved conclusively, in Dope Inc., was that the drug trade is run top-down, it's run through the British monarchy and various criminal enterprises that are sponsored and protected by British intelligence, by the British financial apparatus. And we went back to the history. You know, people may not remember it, but certainly they do in China, that there were two opium wars in the middle of the 19th century where the British Navy went in to China to uh, the open ports of Hong Kong and Canton and used military force to impose opium addiction on the populations of China. And during that period, the British set up an entire structure for running the Far East drug trade. They set up the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation that was the central clearinghouse bank where the revenues of the illegal drug trade could be deposited and circulated around the world and integrated into the British finance system. They created the P&O steamship line, Pacific and Orient steamship line, as the means for trafficking the drugs around the world. They set up a company called Jardine and Matheson, which was a trading company that basically handled the marketing of opium futures and handle that aspect of the trade. So in other words, an entire global financial apparatus was set up before the middle of the 19th century to handle the opium trade and related other drug trades that were being sponsored top down by the British. And uh, we did studies, we interviewed people, for example, who had been in various government intelligence agencies, the CIA, uh, German intelligence, other intelligence services in different parts of the globe who had been battling the drug trade and who had certain eyewitness kind of sense certainty information, which they didn't understand the significance of. But as we were assembling this picture and looking at it top down from a historical standpoint, and understanding the importance of these drug funds to the overall functioning of the British financial system, uh, a different picture came together. Uh, we went to law enforcement agencies after the initial edition of the book was published, 1979, 1980, in the early 1980s, and uh, people were absolutely astonished that the most fundamental axioms that they had been working off of, namely this idea that criminal syndicates are underground and have to sneak their way into the banking system and things like that, it's totally wrong. And that they had to take a completely different approach. Uh, in the mid-1980s, Lyndon LaRouche delivered a uh, presentation at a conference in Mexico City in which he laid out the parameters of how to conduct a war on drugs within the Western Hemisphere. And one of the main things that he emphasized was that you had to go after the money laundering, follow the money. And if you followed the money, you would find that all of the British offshore financial centers, as they were back in the middle of the 19th century, were in the middle of the laundering of the drug money. If you prevented the flow of those funds into the banking system, then the drug traffickers themselves would choke on their own cash.
because you're talking about trillions of dollars a year today. Uh, but even back when we did the original study in 1979, we were looking at $300 billion, which was an enormous sum of money back then. It was larger than General Motors when General Motors was still a first tier global automobile manufacturing company. It was larger than the biggest grain cartels. It was the world's number one industry, but it was done completely offshore. And it relied on the fact that British banks in places like the Cayman Islands or in the allied Dutch Antilles, now more recently uh, Dubai in the Persian Gulf, these are major offshore centers directly tied to the big city of London banks. And those banks right now are in a process of meltdown and final disintegration. So as I say, it's a kind of a delicious irony that the book is out at a moment when the core of the dope inc apparatus, the money laundering system, the inter-alpha group of Lord Jacob Rothschild to name a central component of it, probably 70% of the uh, bank transactions worldwide have gone through the inter-alpha banks until very recently. But if, if you shut the doors of the banks and place police guards at the front door, then uh, this is a crucial, crippling blow to the entire international narcotics trade. How, how, how have the British reacted to this expose over the years by EIR, and what do you think the reaction could be now? Well, look, the, the, the reaction from the very beginning uh, was that the British went completely berserk. Uh, I mean, really, the, the fact of the British control over this massive global criminal enterprise and the idea that we made a direct link between the British royal family and this international drug apparatus drove them completely crazy. And uh, basically, they wanted blood from the very outset. Um, the British response was to go after Lyndon LaRouche as the person who commissioned this study and was the intellectual guide behind the whole effort. Uh, they basically decided that LaRouche was an enemy who had to be disposed of. And so uh, what began in 1979 was a brutal campaign of vilification, slander, uh, attempted assassinations, ultimately a political frame-up and a jailing of LaRouche and quite a number of his associates. Uh, and uh, they were committed to the idea that they were going to put all of their various resources at the disposal of destroying LaRouche and shutting him down. Ironically, as they did this, because we didn't fold our tents and we pushed back, um, they wound up exposing their hands even more so. You know, at the very outset, it was all kind of obvious and transparent. In New York City, you had a prominent mob attorney named Roy Cohen, who was the point person initially for a slander campaign against LaRouche that came directly down from the top, orders from London, run through conduits like the New York Times, but Cohen was the point person, and they picked up a bunch of real nasty smear characters, Dennis King and others like that. And then the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai Brit, a long-standing British asset of the City of London Zionist apparatus, they got into the act and started a major campaign of slander. At a certain point in the mid-1980s, they had Henry Kissinger deeply involved uh, basically pressuring for a corrupt FBI investigation into LaRouche. Uh, you had elements of the National Security Council, the neoconservatives. At one point, the British tapped into Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the head of the Soviet Union after the death of Andropov. And he demanded LaRouche's scalp. He so much as came out and said, LaRouche should be murdered 
for the kinds of things that he's doing. And in every one of these instances, we looked back and tracked out the point of origin of all of these attacks to the British monarchy, to the structures of power in Britain. And, uh, you know, I mean, at one point there was a very funny segment on the TV show Saturday Night Live where they were, uh, you know, both ridiculing but also exposing. Uh, you know, LaRouche says that the Queen pushes dope. Well, you know, we were never implying that Queen Elizabeth II goes out onto the street in front of Buckingham Palace with, you know, nickel bags and tries to, you know, sell drugs on the street. But the fact of the matter is that the British East India Company, uh, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, all of these entities that made up the very heart of the global dope trade uh, were royal chartered operations. So in that sense, yes, the queen does push dope. She is at the center of a power structure of a British empire that has used opium as a form of warfare against humanity and civilization for the last several hundred years. So they don't like him. And they thought that they would eliminate the LaRouche factor and that this would contribute to their own ability to survive. Well, Mr. LaRouche is 88 years old. He's still around. And now we see the specter of the core banks of the British financial oligarchy going through their death throes. So it's a nice moment for Dope Inc. to be back out in print again. And it's one of these things that I think really is a must read for anybody who wants to understand all of the crises and problems that have uh, beset the world over the last several hundred years and to hone in on understanding why it is that the United States economy has been destroyed and why we're facing the potential of a full-scale dark age. Uh, you've got to read Dope Inc. in order to understand why and how it happened and also to understand what weapons humanity has to defeat this enemy and to do it in the immediate weeks and months ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is.